In this hour, I am thrilled that we have a guest joining us who is an expert on uh, nuclear energy. Um, it's Arnie Gunderson. Arnie's an energy advisor. He's got 39 years of nuclear power engineering experience. He's a former nuclear industry senior vice president. He earned his bachelor's and master's degrees in nuclear engineering. He holds a nuclear safety patent. He was a licensed reactor operator. During his nuclear industry career, Arnie managed and coordinated projects at 70 nuclear power plants around the country. He speaks now on television and radio and at public meetings on the need for a new paradigm in energy production. Production. An independent nuclear engineering and safety expert, Arnie provides testimony on nuclear operations, reliability, safety, and radiation issues to the NRC, congressional and state legislatures, and government agencies and officials throughout the United States, Canada, and internationally. In 2008, he was appointed by the Vermont Senate president to be the first chair of the Vermont Yankee Nuclear Power Plant Oversight Panel. He has testified in numerous cases and before many different legislative bodies, including the Czech Republic Senate. Now, I bring all of that up because Arnie is here to talk with us and to share some information with us that's pretty disconcerting, but he has a background that means he understands these things, and I have a feeling he understands these things way better than we do, and some of his information is really going to take us by surprise. His website, by the way, is Fairwinds, F-A-I-R-E-W-I-N-D-S dot com. Arnie, thanks so much for being with us this evening. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, let's talk about Fukushima. I understand you traveled to the site of the disaster. Well, you didn't get uh, all the way into where the power plants were, did you? Uh, no, I, I was in Tokyo, and then I was at a, another nuclear plant that is also shut down, but I didn't get to in, into Fukushima. Yeah, but uh, tell us what you did see there. You did some testing uh, while you were there, didn't you? Yeah, um, there's, a, there's a large body of, of good data coming out of a, a group of citizen scientists called SafeCast. Uh, they've taken 2 million data points throughout Japan, um, and um, uh, it, it, they're just an incredible volunteer organization. But when I was over there, I, um, I, I brought a Geiger counter, and uh, I, I just took random soil samples. I didn't look for the highest spot or anything like that. Um, I, I was there five days. I took five samples. And um, um, when I came back to the States, I, I declared them through customs, and um, came back to the States, ran them through a lab, and found that all of them would qualify as, as nuclear waste if it happened here in the United States. And, and I think the point I was trying to make by, by uh, taking a look at that, you know, Tokyo is Japan's capital, mm -hmm. and um, what would it be like if our capital had that, that quantity of, of radioactive waste? How would we feel? And yet within, um, oh, geez, within less than 100 miles of Washington, D.C., there's about a dozen nuclear reactors. So it's not implausible that it could happen here. Well, was the contamination that you discovered, was that from the normal operation of these plants, or was that because of the, of the, the horrible accident that happened? No, we're sure it was from Fukushima. And the, the way you can be sure of that is um, there's two isotopes, cesium-134 and cesium-137. And... Um, um, those are emitted in a certain ratio, uh, almost one-to-one. -one. And um, we saw both of those in exactly the right ratio. So um, it's certain it didn't come from bomb testing or it hadn't been on the ground from uh, Hiroshima or Nagasaki, you know, 60 years ago. Yeah. But it came from the accident of Fukushima. So, but, but what does that mean? I mean, does it, does it mean that somebody's going to die? Does it mean that somebody's going to get cancer from that? Or, or does, I mean, does it mean anything to find that level of contamination anywhere? Well, what it, you know, it's a, um, it's a public health hazard as opposed to a personal health hazard. And, and by that I mean um, there's about 35 million people in metropolitan Tokyo. And when they're all exposed to levels like that, um, um, the, the incidence of cancer is going to be higher um, as a result. So what, and they're at a point now where they can't run and, and they can't hide, but they can take precautions. Um, one of the samples I had was from a, uh, a, a kid's um, a school play yard, and it had been decontaminated, and uh, it was still um, uh, radioactive to the yeah. tune of uh, five or 6,000 disintegrations per second in a, in a kilogram of soil, about two pounds of soil 
every second would be disintegrating at, at 6,000 disintegrations. So, you know, kids are playing in that. And so, you know, we're, we're advocating taking lots of precautions. You know, the, the Japanese, thankfully, take their shoes off at the door. Uh, so you're not going to track it in. But especially for the kids, because they're mm-hmm. so much more radio sensitive. That means they're more sensitive to radiation than... than um, because, well, yeah, and, and they'll put the dirt in their mouths. You got it. That's what kids do. I was taking the sample, and there were two little boys running around throwing stones at each other. Yeah. Now, you know, <laughs> you're absolutely right. Yeah. Oh, well, I have triplets who are eight years old. I, I know how kids are. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I read an article, and, and the reason that I actually asked you to join us was because I read this piece, and uh, it actually gave me goosebumps. It was a piece that was about reactor four, the Daiichi plant, uh, reactor four, written by Akio Matsumura. And I want to share with you how the article begins and share with our audience as well. It says, Japan's former ambassador to Switzerland, Mr. Mitsuhi Murata, was invited to speak at the public hearing of the Budgetary Committee of the House of Counselors on March 22nd, 2012, on the Fukushima. Fukushima nuclear power plants accident. Before the committee, Ambassador Murata strongly stated that if the crippled building of Reactor Unit 4 with 1,535 fuel rods in the spent fuel pool 100 feet above the ground collapses, not only will it cause a shutdown of all six reactors, but will also affect the common spent fuel pool containing 6,375 fuel rods low located some 50 meters from reactor 4. In both cases, the radioactive rods are not protected by a containment vessel. Dangerously, they are open to the air. This would certainly cause a global catastrophe like we have never before experienced. He stressed that the responsibility of Japan to the rest of the world is immeasurable. Such a catastrophe would affect us all for centuries. Ambassador Murata informed us that the total numbers of the spent fuel rods at the Fukushima Daiichi site, excluding the rods in the pressure vessel, is 11,421. This sounds pretty frightening to me, Arnie. Um, and I hate to say it, but it's not over the top. I've been working with Ambassador Akio Matsumura for a year now, and, and he is as level-headed as any human being on the, on the planet. Um, I was quoted a, a year ago as saying that if the Unit 4 fuel pool were to um, collapse or, or break and run out of water, um, we would have Chernobyl on steroids. And, and that's still true today. And, and, and here's what's going on there. Um, the, the fuel pools on this type of reactor, this Mark I design, don't have a containment building around it. They basically have a, you know, like a, the storage shed you go down to Sears and buy. They have a, a, <laughs> oh, Lord. They have a storage shed on the top. Uh-oh. And, and the storage shed is, is, has, was blown to smithereens. So the, the water in the fuel pool is now exposed directly to the atmosphere. And um, if, the, if there's a large seismic event, a seven or a seven and a half, the, less than the previous one because the buildings are damaged, but, mm-hmm. but it, would, um, it would either crack the pool or make the building collapse. Now, there's one study done by Brookhaven National Labs, and it was, uh, it's about 10 years old, and it said in the event that the, the fuel is not cooled in a fuel pool, you can expect um, about 180,000 cancer fatalities. Okay, Arnie, I want you to hold on. I've got to take a break, but this is important. I, w- I want us to spend some time on this. So hold on with me. We'll come back. A year since the uh, earthquake, the horrible earthquake, and then the tsunami that caused the damage that it caused uh, in Japan. And, of course, we know about the uh, Daiichi plants there, and uh, we were all watching it. And we saw that explosion that happened when they did the hydrogen release, and, you know, we were all talking and all nervous. And what we thought, I think, Arnie, was that if there was going to be a really, really big disaster, that we were imagine all of it, none of us know this stuff. You know this stuff. We don't know this stuff. We think about the China syndrome, and what we imagine is that suddenly this whole power plant starts sinking and it goes way, way, way down, and then this big mushroom cloud comes up, and it's like an atomic bomb that's exploded right there. So that's what we thought, and we figured if that didn't happen, uh, everything was probably going to be okay. They got everything under control. Tell us what the reality is, though. This is like um, a, a Chucky horror movie. You know, you, you, every time you... <laughs> 
every time you think exactly. you got it killed, it comes back. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and um, and the biggest problem still is uh, is that fuel pool on Unit Four. Yeah. You know, they each of them. First off, there's this comment called the safe shutdown, and you'll hear it if Diablo Canyon shuts down or San Onofre. They'll say the unit safely shut down. Now, what that means is the control rods fall in, but that only puts 95% of the heat away. Okay, now wait. When the control rods fall in, what they do is they get between the things that are reacting with one another and stop the reaction, the chain reaction it. from going? Okay. You got it. All right. But because the chain reaction already occurred, there's pieces of uranium called fission products that are left, and they give off about 5% of the heat from the nuclear reactor, and that doesn't stop. So, of course, what happened at Fukushima was because they couldn't cool that 5%, um, they had the explosions and the, and the melt-throughs and all that kind of stuff. Right. So, um, that, and, and we still don't know everything that's going on inside there, do we? I mean, didn't I hear recently that it's so hot that the robots can't even function in there? Yes, uh, the the radiation exposure in the best reactor, which is Unit Two, was uh, seven thousand R an hour. A thousand R will kill you in about fifteen minutes. So mm. you know this is incredibly mm. high radiation, so high that it would affect robot circuitry in an hour or two. So um, how they're uh, going to solve those problems is um, you know we're relying on technology that hasn't been built yet to solve. Um, those problems, and then these the, the the pools that have the spent fuel rods, and we're talking now reactor four. This this scary situation where you've got this structure that's all damaged, and this is sort of in the open air. I mean, it's covered with water, but it's right. up in the air, and there's nothing covering it right now, right? Right. Okay. And what makes reactor four so bad is that not only does it have old fuel, like unit one has fuel that's like twelve years old, and it's plenty cool. But Reactor 4 has one-year-old fuel that had just been removed from the nuclear reactor uh -huh. and is now sitting in that pool. So if the pool were to leak or if the pool were to lose its cooling, uh, it would either boil dry or run dry quite quickly. What happens then is the, the fuel rods get hot enough that the metal, called zircaloy, burns in air. It just sucks up the oxygen from air mm -hmm. and, and burns, in which case you don't have a meltdown. You've got a, 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 a pyre of uh, you know, radioactive smoke going up. And, uh, you know, the, and so the comment that um, Ambassador Matsumura was talking about was that, um, I think, was that if the wind is blowing, uh, some of the time the wind blows out to sea, and thank God, if there was a savings grace at Fukushima, is that 80% of the nuclear um, um, the radiation went out to sea, and only 20% went inland. It could have easily have been just the other way, in which case Japan would have been cut in half for 300 years. Oh, my God. So the concern is that that can happen if the fuel pool catches fire. And then if the... Whatever has gone out to sea, whether it's come from the water that's leaked, because we know about that, or the water that was used to try to cool things down in the in the beginning after, you know, the generators were, were shut down and everything, uh, when the water goes out to sea, is that okay? I mean, it's radioactive, but the sea's really big. So does it make that not a dangerous situation? Um, it makes it less dangerous. You know, it, there's still the same amount of radiation, but like you said, the Pacific Ocean is a big place. And um, I suspect we'll see it working its way up the food chain through fish and, and ultimately winding up on, on people's dinner plates. But, but compared to it lying on the soil, yeah. um, like is happening in some areas of Fukushima, but could happen throughout Japan, compared to that, it's, it's much less severe. Okay, let me ask you, and obviously I know nothing about this stuff, so it's, it's all an education to me. Let me ask you about the pools themselves. They're not covered up. They've got these rods in there that are that would that are trying to cool down. Are they while they're cooling? I assume they're still emitting radioactivity. Does the water prevent? I mean, is it not still going out into the air? Uh, 